everybody. How are you doing today? Good. Do I seem loud to me? Maybe my ears are working today. The great and powerful... We are in a series we just began last week about the book of Acts. And uh, I feel very clever that I've decided to call this series the book of Acts. So I came up with that myself. Um, we started last week to just look at the first few verses, and so we're picking it up at verse 4 of the first chapter. Now, a couple of things to know as we begin today. The first chapter itself is kind of a, a prologue, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's introducing what is going to happen in the rest of the book. And so... As people have read this book over the, over the centuries, about the second century A.D., they started saying that it is the Acts of the Apostles. That's the full title that they found written in manuscripts, the Acts of the Apostles. It was written in Greek, like all of the New Testament, kind of fish market Greek, ancient Greek, called Koine, which was just the common sort of language that people spoke from one culture to another to be able to communicate and to barter and trade and travel and things like that. So on the manuscripts, it uses the word, what we would say acts, it uses the Greek word praxis, where we get our word practice, which is used in ancient Greek to mean like deeds or accomplishments, achievements of great people. You see the, the, the acts or the, the praxis of this general or this emperor or, or this, this particular you know, mighty person or whatever. And so as people have read the book of Acts through the centuries, some people have come to the conclusion that calling it the praxis, the Acts of the Apostles, was maybe not the best title. Maybe they should have called it the praxis of the Holy Spirit. Because the book is really not so much what the Apostles are, are doing, although you do see them everywhere, they're main characters, main players in this book, but it really is the, the Holy Spirit that is doing all of the heavy lifting, the one that's making everything happen. Now, we started last week, like I said, seeing the first three verses in which Jesus has been crucified, he's been resurrected, and he is appearing off and on to this small band of followers that he has. And the scripture tells us in those first verses that he appears uh, to them and gives many convincing proofs that he is in fact alive. They saw him crucified, they saw him buried, but now they're seeing him walk around in this new kind of glorified body. And, and so they, they have all of these proofs. And Luke tells us that it was kind of a period of about 40 days from his resurrection um, to the time that he ascends, which we'll read about a little later on. And that in that time, that's when he gave them all these proofs. And that he spoke to them, Luke said, Jesus spoke to them in this time period um, specifically about the kingdom of God. Now, over the course of 40 days, there's probably a lot of things that he told them. But Luke, and I'll just take the next step and say God, chose to give us this one thing that we're going to look at today. This one discussion that they had. This one teaching that Jesus gave the guys who would lay the foundations for the church. And he gives us this one because it is the most important thing that he could say at that point about the kingdom of God, 
about what God was doing in the world, about what God had been doing in the world for centuries and was going to continue to do until it was completely accomplished. Something Jesus calls in the book of Matthew, the renewal of everything. Now up on the screen, we're going to read the first few verses of this section. Now remember, it's a period of 40 days. He's talking to them about the kingdom of God. And in this, he's giving them many convincing proofs that he is in fact alive. On one occasion, Luke tells us, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water. That is John the Baptist that you can read about in the, in the four Gospels. John baptized with water, but in a few days, and it literally was going to be a few days, in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now the topic, if you probably guessed it by now, the thing that Luke decides to tell us about is all about the Holy Spirit. Now as we read these next few verses, we are going to see three essential truths about the Holy Spirit. These truths are how we're going to see the Holy Spirit viewed throughout the New Testament, and is also how the Holy Spirit is viewed in the Old Testament, the scriptures leading up to the time of Jesus birth. So I want to give you three things this morning, and we'll kind of discuss those. Here's the first thing. This is the first most important truth about the Holy Spirit that we get from this section and is really seen throughout the book of Acts. And that is that the Holy Spirit, first and foremost, is God's promised gift. Is God's gift. God's gift that would appear in what the prophets and later the apostles following their lead would call these last days. The Holy Spirit is going to be for them evidence... ...that God has now kicked into effect his plan... ...in which his kingdom is going to break into world history... ...and begin transforming things around. Now, the, the kingdom of God, and we'll see this a lot... <clears throat> ...was thought in their mind of being the time when Messiah comes... And he sort of begins to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem. He would vanquish any enemies. In this case would be Rome that was occupying them. He would begin to establish justice on the earth. He would, if I can say it this way, right all wrongs. He would, he would bring all injustice to justice. And everything would begin to turn around and would begin to operate in this massive context of his love that's exercised in his Authority. What, what powers his authority? How does he guide his authority? It is through love, through righting all wrongs, through bringing all injustice to justice. And that was what they were anticipating. That's what they were waiting for. And they understood that that would occur, one of the signs, the primary sign, when that was going to happen, would be the Holy Spirit's coming on all people. We'll see that in a couple of weeks when Peter preaches his first sermon. The Holy Spirit is a promised gift. They know that. And they understand that because they know the Hebrew scriptures. And within the Hebrew scriptures, there is a, a series of covenants. Think of covenants as promises that are made. And one of those covenants is called the new covenant. The new covenant because it counters the first covenant God made with Israel through Moses. First covenant looks like this. My people Israel, I'm with you. I'll bless you. I'll put you in this land. I'll provide for you. I'll keep you safe from your enemies. And someday I will raise up a great king in the line of King David who will rule over heaven and earth. That's the old covenant. If, he says, you will walk in my ways. And that's where we get the 613 Mosaic laws of the Old Covenant. The New Covenant looks like this. My people Israel, since you're completely incapable really of following my laws, because I'm holy and you are not, my laws are going to serve as a teacher to you, a tutor, to demonstrate the absolute brokenness of all humanity. Didn't make you that way, but that's what happens when we begin to live our own way. And so my laws are really going to serve not as a way to find new relationship with me, but as a way to point out just how much we really need God in our lives. They will be a tutor to you, a teacher 
to guide you on that path. Then will come the new covenant. And in the new covenant, we will just, God says, begin to work in you. Take out the heart of stone, put in a heart of flesh. Take out that hard, cold stuff that refuses to respond to my love for you and put in a heart, a living heart, a spirit heart that is able to respond and know me and live with me just as I created you. Now look up on the screen. This is one of those examples, or many examples throughout the prophets especially. But this is in Ezekiel chapter 36. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Now look at this. And I will put my spirit in you. Now underscore that because the way the Holy Spirit always worked was he came on a prophet and the guy would prophesy. He came on a general and the guy would lead him in victory. He came on a king and the king would exercise some kind of wisdom and then he would go away. God's promise in the new covenant is that's not going to happen that way. He's not going to just be with you. He will be in you. Meaning God will make up ...his residence within you. What is the church? The church is people who have God living in them... ...as a collected body of his, of his people. So that's what he says. I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees... ...and be careful to keep my laws. We'll now want to live with God. We'll now have a desire to live with God. We'll now love to trust in his love... ...and walk out his leadership in our lives. We'll do it because the spirit of God... ...is living in us if we will respond to the Spirit of God. Now see, this is why Jesus says at the Last Supper... ...as he takes the cup, he says, this cup is the new covenant... ...brought about by my blood poured out for you. The new covenant, like the old covenant, was brought in with sacrifice. But in the new covenant's case, it is the sacrifice of Jesus... ...on behalf of all humanity to remove sin, to face death squarely and to conquer it. Death could not hold. And now he pours out the spirit. The new covenant comes. Look up at the screen. This is not in your notes, but I want to show you this. This is the apostle Paul talking. And he says, he talking about God. He made us competent as ministers of what? A new Covenant. See, we're not, we're not doing it the old way anymore. He's brought in the new covenant. The spirit of, is here. And this is how he says it. Not of the letter, meaning not of what's written down in the old Mosaic laws. Not of the letter, but of the spirit for the letter kills. Meaning what? Meaning I can't follow those laws. It just goes to serve as a teacher to me how broken I really am. How much I need God. I was never meant to follow the laws on my own. Do you know that? I was never meant to grin and bear it and be a good person. Ask somebody, do you think when you die, you will be with the Lord forever? The response we all give at first is, well, I've lived a good life. But no one who knows you would agree with that. You know that, right? And your parents really wouldn't. Uh, that little sinner's going straight, to, you know. Right? I was meant instead to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. God's promised gift in these last days as a sign of the new covenant coming to pass. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The Holy Spirit is God's promised gift. The second thing the Holy Spirit is, is God's power. God's power for life and for service. Power for life and ...and for service. It is the Holy Spirit who empowers me... ...who enables me to begin to respond to God... ...who transforms me... ...who does that new creation thing in me... ...so that I now am capable of living with God... ...of hearing God... ...of responding to God. It is the Holy Spirit's presence in me... ...that brings the love of God... ...and the peace of God... ...and the joy of God... ...and the patience of God... ...the goodness, the gentleness, the kindness... ...the self-control, the faithfulness... ...all of these things... ...are what the Holy Spirit produces in me. I will probably say it about a hundred million times... ...throughout the series of Acts. But understand, you were never meant to gut it out on your own... ...and be good enough. That's why Paul would say, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's no big mystery. We all fall short. So we could never keep up. We all fall short of the glory of God. Then he'll also go on to say the gift of God 
a little bit later on in the book of Romans. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, because they understand the Spirit is the sign of the new covenant. Now, think like the apostles right now, okay? Jewish men raised with an understanding that someday God would send his Messiah and the Messiah would rule the heavens and the earth, would do all those things we talked about. And the sign of that covenant coming to place, the new covenant, be the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus has just said, Holy Spirit's going to come. Don't do anything. Don't do anything. Wait in Jerusalem. Just wait when the Holy Spirit comes, like I promised. So their question, obviously, is, well, if the Holy Spirit's coming, that must mean the kingdom is coming on us in its fullness immediately. Now, that didn't happen. Look at the way they say it. The story goes on. When they met together, it's Jesus and his, his uh, followers, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? See, it was the natural conclusion for these guys. It's what they would naturally think. Jesus responds. It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Now, I cannot resist the temptation. I cannot resist the temptation to say... That what Jesus said, it's not for you. And I'm just going to assume that he means that for me and for you too. Not for us to know the times or dates. Really stands in direct conflict to our continual attempts to know the times and dates. By saying, oh man, look what ISIS is doing. Surely this is what the prophet Haggai meant in that one verse. Into the world's here. Guess we know the times and dates. I've heard people actually go so far as where Jesus says, you, you won't know the day or the hour. And they'll respond with saying, yeah, but we can know the month and the year. Huh? Huh? He didn't exclude that. Now, the whole point is when you get fixated on that stuff, like left behind movies, for instance, when you get fixated on that stuff, you fall right into what Jesus said don't do. And you get fixated on that instead of on living in faithful relationship in the Father's love from day to day like he told us to do. You see the issue, right? So they ask. He says it's not for you to know the times or the dates. Now they're going to understand that they've entered a period in what we would call the last days. We'll see that in a couple of weeks. Not for you to know all that. That's up to the Father to know. But now look at verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, underscore that progression because that's going to have a very important role in reading the book of Acts. But I want to do this. I want to ask you a question this morning, okay? And hopefully can alleviate some guilt. Let's hope we can do that. The question is, When he says, you're going to be my witnesses, what is a witness? That's my question. What is a witness? Because this is how that verse is always read and taught. What a witness is, is somebody who goes evangelizing. Who goes door to door, who stands on a street corner, who strikes up a conversation in every line in the grocery store, who, wherever they are, is going to force a conversation about Jesus. Now, I have done this. I have been the victim of this. I have been party of this. And I can tell you that it always goes south if I'm just forcing it. Is that true? It always goes south. It always goes south. It goes south because it's me doing it and not the Holy Spirit doing it. I cannot tell you how many times I've sat in conversations where me and or friends tried to force the gospel down people's throats. Totally awkward. Weren't talking about that. Hey, I wonder how the Chargers are going to do this. By the the way, you know Jesus died for your sins. I thought we were talking about the Chargers. Chargers, sins, kind of the same thing. It's all very disappointing. That's all I'm going to say. It's all very disappointing. (laughs) We should probably uh, take that off YouTube, Scott. Don't put it in there. Strike that button. Um, but here's what a witness is, okay? That's not what a witness is. That's not what Jesus has in mind. Here's what a witness is. Understand this. A witness 
is simply a person who sees an event. If you are a witness in a court of law, you're there because you saw something that has bearing on the case that's being presented to the jury. That's all a witness is. It's someone who sees an event. For the apostles, they had been with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry and had seen things happen. Look up at the screen. Luke, writing in his gospel, says this. He, talking about Jesus, told them, now look at this. This is what is written. He's talking about the Old Testament scriptures, the prophets, the law, the writings of the Old Testament. This is what is written. The Christ, or Messiah, Christ is the Greek version of the word Messiah. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. They'd seen that. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in, the name, uh, in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. They were going to see that. You are witnesses of these things. See? He's pointing out a fact. You have seen these things happen. Now, what have they seen happen? They've seen the things that the prophets had prophesied about, the promises that would come. They were now seeing those take place place. And you're going to see throughout the book of Acts, as they're talking, as they're preaching, as they're interacting, the Old Testament prophets and Psalms, scriptures come up over and over and over. In Peter's first sermon, he's going to say, this is exactly what Joel told us was going to happen at this point. They're witnesses of seeing the things begin to happen that the prophets had prophesied. They were seeing it. And they're going to call themselves witnesses over and over. Now he says the same thing he says in in verse 8 of Acts 1. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the cities, Jerusalem, until you have been clothed with power from on high. Now here's the second thing about a witness. And I'm already kind of alluded to this. I just want to say it very plainly. Jesus never says to them, go witness. Did you hear that? He never says, go witness. Well, doesn't he say, go into all the world and make disciples? Yes, but if you look at the Greek construct, what he's really saying is, as you're going through all the world, every place you go, I'm going to be working. You can help people come to know me. Do you see that? He doesn't say, go. Go witness as though it is a verb. He says, you will be a witness. You'll be my witness. You've seen things. You've seen these things occur. Now you're going to give testimony. You will be a witness for me. And that's one of the first things that is said. Again, this is uh, Peter in the first sermon he's going to... Uh, going to preach, we see this in chapter 2. It says, God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of the fact. Now, why am I pointing this out? Because I have a question for you. And the question is this. If they'd already seen all this stuff occur, which they had. They'd seen Jesus living his life. They'd seen him doing miracles. They'd, they'd seen him teaching the crowds and people responding. They'd, they'd seen him raise people from the dead. They, they'd then seen him be arrested, just like he said, being arrested in Jerusalem. They'd seen him, him be crucified, just like he said. They'd seen the burial. Then they saw him resurrected. Then over a period of 40 days, he showed himself many convinced. They'd seen it all. Why do they have to wait? Why wait? Why don't they go witness? What's the point of waiting? Why does Jesus say, do nothing until power from on high, until the Holy Spirit comes? Don't do anything. Why is that? Third thing about the Holy Spirit. The answer is in this third thing about the Holy Spirit, this third truth. And that is because it is the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit only that causes the progression of God's kingdom. Only the Holy Spirit causes the progression. I can't force it 
to happen. It is a work of God. Jesus said, I will build my church, not you go build my church. And as we've tried to over the centuries go and build his church, we have seen catastrophe. As people have been forced into baptism at, you know, spear point or knife point. As, as this denomination says, we have it all. And this denomination says, oh, we have it all. And they gossip about one another at their church potlucks. You know what I'm saying? You, with, you, you hear what I'm saying? Because we have gone to build the church. And Jesus said, that's my job. You just bear testimony of what I'm doing in you. One of the most powerful stories I ever heard was from someone who was very, very dear to me that I grew up with. Raging alcoholic, raging drug addict. He called me one night, two in the morning. And he said, I need you to do me a favor. And I'm thinking, I need you to do me a favor. Call between eight and five. <laughs> I said, what is it? And he said... I'm going to give you, and he was, by the way, t totally wired on speed at the time. He said, I'm going to give you a number. He's amazingly clear, actually, for the condition he's in. So, okay. He said, this is the number of my friend. Gave me the friend's name. All right. He said, I need you to call him. Because, he said, these are his exact words. He has something I need. What does he have? You just got to talk to him. He has something I need. I said, well, can you... Can... Hi, you don't know me. You have something uh, this guy needs. Are you from the IRS? No, 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 no. I'm a friend. He has something I need. So I called the guy the next day. Got a hold of him that evening. And I said, hi, you don't know me. This is my name. I'm Kevin. You know this guy. Apparently you guys work together. And uh, I'm supposed to call you because he says you have something he needs. <laughs> I have no idea what he's talking about. And this man said, oh, I know exactly what he's talking about. So what are you talking about? So when we met in AA. Okay. And he said, during the course, uh, we're in AA. And by the way, this, your friend, this guy, grew up and hardly ever comes. Hit and miss. Mostly miss. Um, when I was in AA, I met Jesus. I said, Really? He said, and he's totally transformed my life. I, my marriage has been restored. My kids will talk to me again. I'm off of alcohol. I'm off of drugs. We do work together, both in the construction industry. And um, I give him a ride because he's lost his license because of some legal complications. So I give him a ride every morning. Pick him up at 5.30 every single morning. And as we drive to work, instead of the stuff we used to listen to, I just like to listen to some music my wife gave me who was already a Christian. And the music just kind of encourages me and gets me ready for my day. I said, Really? And, and this guy's riding right next to you. He's, oh, yeah, he listens to it and sometimes he'll ask me about it. It's interesting. And I said, and what else? He said, well, also, I'm just telling him what God is doing in my life. I'm telling him how God's restored my marriage. I'm telling him how God is working the lives of my family. I'm telling him how God has totally given me freedom from drugs and alcohol. I'm just explaining all of that to him. I said, do you ever tell him, like, you need to get your life? He said, oh, I never say a word about his life. And I never say, hey, if you don't accept Jesus, man, psh, straight south when you die. Never said anything like that. We've never talked about his life unless he's like complaining about, you know, some woman he's with, whatever. So we always talk about my life. You know what the guy was doing? Being a witness. He was forcing nothing. He didn't have in his mind, I'll pick up my friend and I'll go to work witnessing. He was just being faithful to talk about, and partly talk because he was so excited, because it was so life transforming, to just talk about what God was doing in his life. He was being a witness. And because it is the Holy Spirit who causes the progression of his kingdom, the Holy Spirit had set things up in such a way that one man stuck in a lot of bondage was listening to another man who'd been delivered from this bondage by the power of Jesus and the love of God. And this other man was just talking, happily talking about what God was doing in his life. And this man was being impacted. Can I tell you what would have happened if man number one picked up man number two and said, hey, guess what happened to me? And you need to do the same thing. 
Man number two would have started finding another ride to work. That's what would have happened. I've seen it happen a million times. But when the first guy just talked about all the goodness of what God had done in his life, it transformed him. I know missionaries in some very intense places around the world. Intense places. Where to be a Christian is not exactly illegal, but it sure isn't safe. They don't stand on any street corners. They'd be arrested. You know what they do? They live for Jesus. And people see that. They make relationships with their neighbors because the Holy Spirit loves to bring the love of God around the world. And people begin to open their hearts and their doors. And as they do, people take the risk of saying, tell me more about Jesus. Tell me, tell me more. So the man said, and I was telling you about the guy I grew up with, you have what I need. The Holy Spirit progresses the church. Now, what's the problem? Most of us don't live in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what happens. And so in our own power, in our own energy, we progress the church. We will build our church. And you see monuments to human power all over North America. It doesn't seem like we see much of the power we see in the book of Acts that was promised to us by Jesus himself and by the Old Testament prophets. Now the story ends like this. This section anyway. After he said this, stuff we just read about, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. And this is called the ascension. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white robes, uh, dressed in white, excuse me, stood beside him. We understand this to be angels. Angel from a Greek word, angulos, simply means a messenger, one who carries a message of some kind. And here's what they say. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. In other words, you're entering a new period of human history here. Don't be worrying about the day and the hour, the month and the year and putting together charts and timelines. Don't worry about all that. Live right now in the power of God that he's given you through the promised Holy Spirit. Now, the rest of the book of Acts is in effect... Nothing more than the Holy Spirit empowering the apostles and others along the way to be witnesses. That's what it is. In fact, you can kind of outline it this way up on the screen. You jot this down on your outline if you want. We're in the prologue, chapter 1, where all the groundwork is being laid about Jesus and his resurrection, because that's the message, about the Holy Spirit, because that's the power. Next week, we'll look at the apostles and what's going on there because those are the primary messengers because they've seen him, they've been with him, they're going to be his primary witnesses to lay the foundation for all of, all of what God is going to do and is continuing to do. But once you get past the prologue, you can outline the book, you can see the progression like this. The first seven chapters are simply the witness in Jerusalem. That's what we're going to see. Starting in chapter 2, going through chapter 7, you're going to see the apostles and others just bearing witness in the city of Jerusalem. Then there's a persecution in Jerusalem from the Jewish religious leaders, and they're going to begin to spread out, and the next section is the witness in Judea and Samaria, just areas around Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the capital of Judea. Judea is the Roman name for all of that area for that region. And that's going to go into chapter 12. And from chapter 12 and a little earlier than that, we're going to meet a really bad guy named Saul who's going to find himself coming to Jesus by faith. And he is going to be transformed in a radical way. He is the great arch enemy of the people of God until chapter 9. In chapter 13, he starts a series, there's three of them, of missions to the non-Jewish world. And then you see the, the witness to the ends of the earth. And that goes from chapter 13, where he starts these journeys, all the way to chapter 28, where he finds himself under house arrest in Rome, the 
ends of the world, the, the capital city of all of the civilized world. In fact, it's, it's going to end like this. I'm going to just throw this up on the screen real quick. This is how the book of Acts ends. This is talking about Paul under house arrest, city of Rome. Boldly and with, without hindrance, he, that's Paul, preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how the book's going to end. Bearing witness, just as Jesus said to do, to the ends of the earth by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is the Holy Spirit who progresses this whole thing along. Now, one more thing, and then we're going to pray. Last week I said one of the primary reasons God has given us this book, the book of Acts, is to encourage us how to live as his people, as his church, the assembled people of God. That's why he's given us this book. This is the last thing I want to say then. It seems just looking at the prologue that where we really begin is to learn to live by the power of the Spirit of God. If I give my life to Jesus, I receive him as my Savior, put my faith in him, the Spirit of God comes to dwell within me. That's his promise. Now it's not a life of figuring it out on my own, of sort of, you know, grabbing the bull by the horns and making life work. Now it is a slow, beautiful progression of learning to trust God, relying on his love, and responding to what the Spirit of Jesus is speaking to me. And what I'm going to find, among other things, is as I begin to live that way, I'm going to find a new joy I didn't have, a new sense of the love of God filling my heart I didn't have, and a new peace. I'm going to find new wisdom, a new direction. And as I respond to that, I'm going to find things that I thought were impossible are absolutely easy for God. God making a way. Not that he's going to do everything I ask, but he's going to take all of my life circumstances and in his own power use them for amazing things if I'll let him. I want to be a witness too. I want to, I want to be used by God to help people know Jesus too because it's the greatest thing in my life. But it doesn't begin with me studying a course or reading some verses and then going out on a mission. It starts with me letting the Holy Spirit begin to give me the power to live for Jesus moment by moment by moment. And that's my prayer for you and me as we kind of go through this series that we will learn as we see the apostles and other people living that way what it really means to fulfill Paul's statement that we should live by the filling, the control, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray together. Father, we just praise you for the promise of the Holy Spirit. What we see in the book of Acts are pretty common and sometimes really broken people being absolutely transformed, learning how to respond to you through your power, letting Jesus now be the Lord and finding in that lordship absolute life and hope and joy. Father, you never tell us to fix ourselves, transform ourselves, re re renew ourselves. You never tell us to get better and better. You never tell us to fix our own problems. You tell us to come to you as we are, broken, wounded, all of the stuff we carry, and just allow you to have your way in us. And as we do that, we see you making all of the difference. So I would just pray for us as friends, as family, that we would begin to take that risk of letting you have your way in our lives. And I pray today, Father, for um, anyone here today who has never taken that first step of faith and just, just putting, putting simple faith in Jesus. Pray for that, that man or woman, that young person, that today would be their day. Today they would sense your love and your presence. You're knocking on the door of their heart and they would say, Lord Jesus, come in today. I want to give my life to you. I want to follow you. I want you to be my savior too. I want to be your child too. I want to live my life with you. Give you full permission, best I can, to have your way in me. Father, we bless you. Bless you for your grace. We bless you for your goodness. 
we thank you for this day. We pray it in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. God bless you guys. I'm here if you want to talk or pray. Have a great day. Thank you.